we're going to hear from Dick Leach about Sharia law for non-Muslims. Any non-Muslims here? <laughs> okay, this is about Sharia law for y'all. Dick? Hello again. <laughs> I'm going to make some remarks here, and then uh, we're going to close with uh, something that Linda's got about what's going on in England. But I'm going to back up to uh, where I was before I came here. Before I retired, I was a professor of uh, philosophy and religion at a little college in uh, Wisconsin called Lakeland. Um, and it was my privilege there to speak uh, to uh, teach courses in comparative religion over the, through the 70s and 80s and 90s. And uh, that didn't make, doesn't make me an expert uh, on Islam because I did no original research nor did I publish in any learned, learned journals. But it did give me access to what most of the scholars uh, have, uh, have talked about uh, Islam up to that point. This led me to a respectful and uh, tolerant uh, view of, uh, of Islam as I held uh, in, to all, all religions. Uh, it was a monotheist religion. It claimed uh, Abraham and the prophets of the Old Testament as its forebears. And, um, it was my, my experience to be able to have uh, students who were Muslim students in my classes from Pakistan and uh, Turkey and other places. Um, we got along well. Um, my son Randy uh, went to Kenya in 79 and uh, came back full of, uh, of, of, um, of being impressed about uh, the Muslim people that he had met there and uh, their, their zeal for, for uh, Allah. Um, I was able to invite uh, Islamic scholars from the University of Wisconsin at uh, Milwaukee to come up and give guest lectures to my students. All of, uh, also we had at, at that time uh, opportunity to uh, invite a group, uh, a family of uh, Muslims from Bosnia, remember in the 90s how uh, the, the uh, war there with the Serbs and the Croats attacking them and they had come to Chicago and, and an enclave of Muslims there and they wanted to get out of that enclave and they came up to Mayville, Wisconsin where we were living and um, uh, my wife's the pastor of that, that church, they stayed in our parsonage upstairs for three weeks. We got well acquainted with them, they came to church uh, and uh, so I have had a lot of good experiences with Muslims. Uh, none of that prepared me for 9-11. Um, I had uh, lectured on all these things and uh, taught the five pillars. We spent a lot of time uh, speaking about the religious aspects of, of, of uh, Islam. But what I had gathered from textbooks and uh, these scholars and these friends uh, in Islam did not prepare me for 9-11. Is that a sign from, from somebody? Anyway, I'm going to keep right on going. Um, but the, the two things that um, I gathered from those sources and from those textbooks is that Islam was a religion, that its tenets were for Muslims and that jihad was primarily the Muslims' inner struggle against wrong belief called the greater jihad. After more thorough examination of Sharia since then, I have found that the first two statements were true, but only half true. Islam is a religion. It is also an Allah-ordained governmental system encompassing every aspect of society, political, economic, judicial, cultural. No other religion requires a land-owning theocratic state for its existence. The half-truth that Islam is a religion 
was not the whole truth. And the half-truth concealed the whole truth. As for the second statement, yes, its tenets were for Muslims, but they were also for non-believers, non-Muslims. The Sharia calls us the kafir, K-A-F-I-R. We are called, that means in Arabic, the ones who conceal the truth about Islam. We must be either converted, eliminated, or subjugated. That means Allah's divine design for society must replace all man-made systems of government. Global conquest is not a suggestion, but an obligation. Sharia is totalitarian and supremacist. The second statement that its tenets were for Muslims was also true. It was not the whole truth. The half-truth concealed the whole truth. The final statement about the greater jihad is a modern misrepresentation. Muhammad never said, and I've examined the source of, sources of Sharia, both the Quran and the Sunni and the Hadith and the Sirah, never said that jihad was primarily an inner, personal, spiritual battle. The Quran and Hadith use that term only as war against non-Muslims, against the unbelievers, against the kafir. It is either by violence or by stealth. <coughs> now all this doesn't mean that, that all Muslims are uh, are jihadists. Uh, the ones I met in Wisconsin certainly were not. Nor can it be said that every Muslim country practices all of Sharia any more than these Muslim students and Muslim friends practice all of Sharia. Pure Sharia probably exists only in the Sunni form in Saudi Arabia and the Shiite form in Iran. But pure Sharia is what is sought by true believers and what is taught officially in mosques everywhere. So how do we explain such contradictions within Islam? More importantly, how do we get half-truths and misrepresent misrepresentation in Islam? <coughs> the answer is that Sharia is dualistic. It holds two sets of laws, one for Muslims and one for kafirs. It also sets forth two ways to approach kafirs. On the one hand, the Quran directs believers to listen to what the kafirs say with patience and leave them with dignity. Surah 73.10 On the other hand, it says, Give strength to believers, O Allah, I will send terror into the kafirs' hearts cut off their heads, and even the tips of their fingers. Quran 8, or, uh, Surah 8, at 12. The Quran is filled with contradictions that it provides a method to resolve for problems. This method is called abrogation. A later verse in the Quran, is strong, if stronger than the earlier one, should replace it. Both are true, but the first is weaker and to replace by the later, stronger one. The stronger supersedes the weaker. Either is correct, but the latter one is better. The doctrine of abrogation. Earlier verses from Mecca are quoted by promoters of Islam when they are in a minority. The later ones from Medina where Muhammad gained control and waged war against kafirs are better and to be used when Muslims gain control. Situational, situationalism, and two laws depending upon the situation. An oath then by a Muslim is flexible. Abu Bakr faithfully kept his oaths until Allah revealed to Muhammad the atonement for breaking them. And afterwards he said, if I make a pledge and later discover a more worthy pledge, then I will take the better action and make amends for my earlier promise. 
So you see the difference between the weaker and the stronger, and the latter abrogates the former. Therefore, something that is not true is not always a lie. Muhammad said, a man who brings peace to the people by making up good words or by saying nice things, though untrue, does not lie. Muhammad re repeatedly told Muslims to deceive kafirs when it would advance Islam. He said, jihad is deceit. In other words, war is deceit. War is deceit. Islam has a word for lies for lies which advance its goals. It is taqiyya. Taqiyya. T-A-Q-U-T-A-Q-I-Y-Y-A. By the way, that's not tequila. <laughs> tequila. It is sacred deception. Sacred deception. There are two conditions for its practice. Number one, a Muslim must never lie to another Muslim. And the lie should never be told unless there is no other way to accomplish the task. Lies are sins except when they are told for the welfare of a Muslim or for saving him from a disaster. I never taught any of that when I was teaching at Lakeland College. How naive I was. There is no golden rule for kafirs. They may be murdered, tortured, enslaved, raped, robbed, deceived, mocked, and ridiculed. But a Muslim is a brother to other Muslims. He should never oppress them, nor should he facilitate their, their oppression. Allah will satisfy the needs of those who satisfy the needs of their brothers. Legal dualism also explains stealth jihad. It is not the shock and awe of violent jihad as in ISIS and Al-Qaeda. There is no immediate terrorism to intimidate and humiliate. It's silent or soft jihad, or as the Muslim Brotherhood describes it, civilization jihad. It is imposed gradually and incrementally after projecting a peaceful, moderate image to the public. How do we know all this? A Muslim Brotherhood document called an explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group in North America. This memorandum was uncovered by the FBI in a 2004 raid on a terrorist safe house in Annandale, Virginia. The document became key evidence in the Holy Land Foundation. Now you think we're talking about Zionists or Jews, but these are Muslims. Holy Land Foundation it was a terrorist financing trial conducted by the Department of Justice in 2008. And the document outlined a master plan for the establishment of a global Islamic state in the U.S. Eliminating, and this is an interesting quote, eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. The document includes a five-phase plan to take control of the United States and establish a global caliphate governed by Sharia. It all starts with organization. And this is a quote, we are in a country which understands no language other than the language of the organizations and one which does not respect or give way to any group without effective, functional, strong organization. One of the best known organizations created by the Muslim Brotherhood here is the Council on American Islamic Relations, C-A-I-R. Established in 1994, headquartered in Washington, D.C. It masquerades as a civil rights charity organization with its spokespersons appearing on TV regularly. Uh, three years ago, CARE sent my wife, who is a pastor of a little church in uh, Hot Springs, a beautiful copy of the Quran. 
and uh, with a bookmark of all the things to look up, and they're all very positive things. They're all the weak, early Meccan quotes from the Quran about family, about religious liberty, about human dignity, about the importance of individuals. It didn't have any references of the strong uh, verses from the Quran, which replace the earlier uh, verses. And, uh, and uh, so on. The Brotherhood has also set up a vast network of educational, legal, social service, and lobbying organizations. In that little clip which we just saw before, there's a, there's a list of about 20 of them, and I got them in my notes, but it includes everyone. The one they were talking about with the Muslim Students Organization, I think that's the one that Huma Abedin was, was uh, working for. Okay, you got me. Um, but anyway, this is, this is where they get the term civilization jihad. It's uh, the Muslim Brotherhood program. Another big part of their master plan is to co-opt America's leadership by infiltrating all levels of society, government agencies, higher education, schools and institutions, religious organizations. Congressional hearings have revealed many of President Obama's top officials in the Department of Defense, Department of State, Department of Homeland Security are tied to the Brotherhood. And they also have infiltrated and dominated the U.S. Middle East studies programs. After the infiltration phase is the escalation phase. Expand Muslim presence by birth rate, by massive immigration, by refusal to assimilate, occupy and expand domination of physical spaces. Everywhere there is a mosque. That is, that is their claim as Allah's territory. And as far as you can see from the top of the minaret. Refusal to assimilate, occupy, and expand domination of physical spaces. Ensure the Muslim community knows and follows the Brotherhood Doctrine. Control the language uh, that America uses in describing Islam and terrorism. Never allow the, uh, the use of the word Islam in connection with terrorism. Phase four is open public confrontation with the government to force compliance with Sharia at local levels. Fight, resist, undermine all counter and terror terrorism efforts. Um, conduct lawfare by lawsuit and threats of lawsuits. Complain, or, uh, claim victimization and demand accommodations. Condemn as slander and homophobic all criticism of Islam. I've been excused of, uh, accused of being homophobic, but uh, I know the difference between a phobia and a fear. Demand the right to practice Sharia in segregated Muslim <coughs> enclaves. Demand recognition of Sharia in non-Muslim spheres confront and denounce Western society, laws, and traditions. And finally, when critical mass is achieved, demand that Sharia replaces U.S. law. Can you see anything like this going on in our country today? Now, so in order to practice their religion, which is not just religious, but political and everything else, they demand that there be Sharia compliance by present uh, institutions and, and uh, processes, process procedures in, in, our, in our free country. Because, absolute, after all, it is a religion. And in the name of religion, they seek that tolerance and that compliance. But remember, that's only a half-truth such as space set aside in rooms for prayer in school and marketplace, special food, halal, be provided there, days off for Muslim holidays, headscarves at work, and, a, and full body burqas for women in sports, no criticism or any, of any aspect of Islam, such as polygamy, jihad, honor killing, or wife beating, welfare support for multiple wives, 
special treatments for Muslim women in hospitals, Sharia banking for the payment of the zakat, that's a two and a half percent uh, alms that they must give each year. And uh, the Treasury Department already has a program out to teach bankers how to provide that so that the system will work for um, in, in, uh, on their terms. That's Sharia compliant bank banking. Some of the zakat, the zakat uh, as specified in the Sharia, must go for terrorist organizations. Anyway, that's a little overview. What can we do? Uh, vote for Donald Trump. You'll <laughs> you'll put you'll put brakes on Muslim immigration. If you vote for Hillary, she would accelerate it. And we've heard some numbers, and they're just astounding. But they would want what she wants to do with people coming from from Syria. Number two. Seven states have banned foreign laws. Sixteen other states are considering such legislation. Linda, you might have a little update on, on those numbers, I'm not sure. But in 2015, legislation to declare American laws for American courts to protect the rights and privileges granted under the U.S. Constitution and the Arkansas Constitution was passed by the General Assembly in the state of Arkansas. It was held up in the Judiciary Committee in the State Senate, and there it died. It will be introduced again next year. We can support that. We can support that. We do not need parallel systems. Mar uh, uh, what did Lincoln say? A house divided against itself cannot stand. And where did you get that quote? I think that's in the Bible. Anyway, we know that we can't stand with Sharia courts and American courts. Muslims come to one, we go into others. That's what's happened already in Great Britain. Anyway, I hope we can mobilize support for that. We know that the four mosques and the various Study centers, Muslim study centers in this state will be all for it, or all against it. And uh, we, it's, it's going to be a political battle next, next year. We can get involved in that. We can pray that God would raise up leaders on local, county, state, and federal levers, levels who will practice their oaths of office to uphold the constitutional republic they serve and to oppose all efforts to ignore or destroy our founding principles as in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And finally, we can share our faith with Muslim neighbors. You know, they might be just about as afraid of us as we are of them. We shouldn't be afraid. Who's got the final victory? We know what that is. But we can be kind to them. We can show them that they're not, that we're not the kind of uh, people that they're told we, that kafirs are not the kind of people that they're told we are. The power of love is greater than the power of fear. The system of Sharia is evil. But Muslims are in the dark about it, as most of us have been. And when we meet them, we can tell them more about the Esau that Jesus in the Quran. They don't know that he died for them. They don't know that he rose from the grave for them because that's not in their story. We can tell them the rest of the story. Amen. Okay, if you want to... And we're gonna we're gonna hear a little clip about what's going on in uh, in England, right, Linda?